Hello and welcome to the Uneducated Rugby podcast with myself, Karen Harris and Lucy Jones. Um, we're back on Zoom this week, and, but for good reason, because we are kindly joined by Gemma Hallett, former Wales international and co-host of the Back the Girls podcast. Uh, first of all, how are you, Gemma? It's great to have you on. Oh, I am splendid, Carolyn, and you know it. <laughs> Yes, uh, you are rather showing off a good tan and <laughs> enjoying your life in the Canary Islands. So th- first of all, thank you very much for taking the time out of yeah. the Canary Islands to be on the pod. No problem. I was sitting by the pool about 20 minutes ago and I was like, oh gosh, I better run up. Um, I'm on with you guys. So I'll be making my way back down there in a bit. Yeah, I, you know, I know you're very busy and especially with the Back the Girl podcast going from strength to strength on the back of what was a record-breaking TikTok Six Nations. How... How much of a response have you found to your own podcast and to, to the greater women's game in general? Oh, do you know what? When it comes to the podcast, we really just felt like we wanted to amplify all the good stuff that was going on in Wales. At the time, it was a lot of well, me in particular shouting about all the bad stuff. But yeah. we kind of we didn't want it to just be that. We wanted to remind people there was loads of great stuff still going on and lots of people still giving a lot to the game in right here in Wales. Um, so the podcast started like that and we anticipated Laurie and, and Phil that maybe some of our, you know, our former mates or, you know, former uh, players and would, would kind of lean into it. But it's been the complete opposite. It's been like it's grown its own community mm. of people we didn't yeah. even know are yeah. our main listeners, our main contributors. And, you know, they, you know, constantly DMing us with people they want to hear from and questions. And the people that we know in rugby don't, don't seem to participate at all. They're probably sick of us by now. <laughs> <laughs> but it has shone this light on this whole new kind of, um, I, th- I think we refer to it as rugby fam. And I know Laurie doesn't like that term, but, you know, th- there is this big growing rugby fam yeah. that we're not aware of. And we're able to kind of, tell this bring the old narrative through but shine a light on all the good stuff that's happening as well and I I think we thoroughly enjoyed doing it both of us yeah, yeah. I, it's a brilliant Shows. listen I absolutely love it I love the podcast I really do I think I think yourself you know you, you I think I think you self-proclaimed go on these rants occasionally but Lori's a star as well in her own right you know some of the some of the one-liners she comes up with actually crack me up um, it, that's that's the right term is to call her a star um, I think the balance is so good because I can proper go on a rant, as you know, and I get really kind of I'm, like in real life, I'm proper chilled. But when it comes to the WRU and what they've done to the women's game, I just, you know, pitchforks are out and I'm on one. Um, but then Lori really balances it out because she is so funny. And I'm so glad it comes across on the podcast because everyone, of, you know, that have played with, against or, or no rug or no Lori knows how funny she is. And she's just able to bring that natural comedy to the show, which then balances out my like kind of edginess, I suppose. So she, it's an absolute, absolute gift to spend maybe two hours a week talking to Lori and then you guys listening in. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I think, I think we feel the same, Lewis, don't we? Because we're pretty chilled yeah. in, in life, but I have spent the last yeah. 24 hours round to two of Jack Morgan <laughs> not being in the Wales squad. So I do fully appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do fully appreciate that. Um, I think, Lucy, you wanted to start off with the beginning, really, didn't you? Yeah. So, yeah, we go back to the beginning, um, mm. start of your career. So can you remember what your earliest rugby memory was um, and, yeah, your first experience of watching or playing the game? Yeah, so um, typical Valley's rugby family, right? My mum was young having me, so I grew up. Um, with my nan my nan was like the matriarchy of the family and my uncles were still teenagers so we all kind of lived together and I grew up in that environment and my uncles played every Saturday and my ma- my nan was a diehard rugby fan so my mom would go out on the weekends and then this rugby family would be left with me and I'd be you know I got pictures of me from uh, a few months old right up to about seven where I'm being dressed up well scarf well shirt you know die cap big um coal mining boots and they'd sit me on the <laughs> sofa and from as old enough to just about sit up myself I was dressed up for the Six Nations ready to watch the games I was kind of like the, the house or family mascot I think um, so I've, I've never known no different you know and in primary school I used to run around the, the, the playground with a rugby ball and, and play with the boys um, lost that when I got to secondary which is a whole issue in, in girls rugby in itself um, 
but you know, watched every weekend with my nan and massive diehard Scott Quinnell fan. Um, and my nan was a Garrett Thomas fan. And, you know, I just remember those great days of watching a really poor Welsh side, but we were always really proud of them, right? Yeah. In 80s, 90s. Um, and then I didn't have the opportunity to play. There was nothing around for, for a girl um, until I went to university in 2001. And I remember walking into, you know, the Freshers' Bay. Yeah. And I was like, oh, a mate of mine was up there. She was going to join the football team. And I was just walking around kind of thinking about, well, you know, let's see if there's anything I want to join. And, you know, never really considered it, but let's have a walk around. And I was actually in my Welsh ship because I went to university in Preston in England. So, of course, I was going to go to the <laughs> yeah, Freshers' so. Bay in a Welsh rugby <laughs> shirt. I do remember that Reebok one. That's the one I was yeah. wearing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was walking through the Freshers' Bay. And somebody just shouted, hey, Taffy. And this rugby ball just come flying <laughs> through the air. And I caught it. And then from that moment on, for four years, I was in the rugby team. Um, and, oh, I loved it. It was like I was finally able to play. Like, I always played in, like, primary school, played in the streets growing up and never had an opportunity. And then got to uni and, and really kind of loved it. I think all that, like, knowledge I, I absorbed of the game, all the passion I absorbed through the game growing up was able to just express itself. And then at university, I was lucky enough that the local club team was starting up the same year. So I got to play for UCLan, uh, which is the university team. I also got to play for Preston Grasshoppers, which is a huge heritage up in there, up in northwest England. Um, and it was a great experience. It was a massive ex- I hadn't played at all properly and then got to play for two teams a week for four years. Um, and, you know, I was playing against uh, English internationals, um, English county there's loads of county players in our league um and it was a bit of a baptism (laughs) but um I loved it I I thrived and I had the opportunity then to come down for Welsh trials I was really lucky to be in a a generation where there was pathways and Mm. I'm sure we'll come on to this later um but I actually got picked up because um, you know, letters went out to the university saying if any Welsh qualifies, send them down for university trials. And I went down to Clan Rumney and had like a weekend camp, um, got exposed to that level of the game. And I was selected to play for Welsh students against Scotland sco- students in 2004. And then from that, played for the development team, went on um, Wales's only. Um, South African winning tour test team went on that tour in 2004 as well and then came back after that and it was kind of the end of the season and I was like oh do you know what I had a glimpse of what the the senior squad was about I hadn't made it to the senior squad yet but I had a glimpse and I thought that's it like my new ambition is to play for Wales um and then just kind of went gung-ho in that mission and luckily enough I had my first cap the following season and played from 2005 to 2014. Yeah. So it was a long time, but I was incredibly grateful that I had the opportunity to play in Pathways. So play for Welsh students, Welsh development, went on that, that tour, and then, you know, I was kind of battled hard and then to get my next, my first cap in the autumns after that. So what team was your debut against then? Um, Do you remember? <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> it's definitely one of two teams. It was the autumn test were against Netherlands and Italy, and I can't remember which way around they were. Which is awful for your first cap, right? I, I think I came off the bench for Netherlands and started the Italy game. Okay, I I thought it was Italy looking into it, but I can't promise that hand on heart. But we we did look into it ourselves, didn't we? We thought it was Italy, but. Maybe, maybe not, because some of these some of these games obviously weren't weren't capped yeah. nationals. How 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 strange an experience was that for you? If you know you're sort of playing for Wales, but you're not playing for Wales in, in a certain context. Not strange at all. I think it's part of the pathway. You've got to earn that shit, right? I, I don't yeah. think anybody should walk into that environment and expect to play. Mm. You you have to. I've known girls that when I first came in, had sat on the bench for like three four years before they had their first cap. You know. Mm. Um, it was that's what the, the pathways were for to get you ready for that first cap so that when you made it up to the senior squad you were battle hard and you were ready to play those games but you know you've got to play your dues nobody can walk into a senior squad 
and expect to get capped. It, like the expectation is wrong. It, it should be the other way around. It should be, okay, I'm going to go into the squad. I'm going to learn as much as I can. I can work as hard as I can. Hopefully I'll get capped. Yeah. Not the, okay, I'm, I've been in here. I've been training and they're not starting me and then disappear because that happens quite a bit. That happens mm-hmm. quite a lot with, with girls as well. So it's a, a bit of a, a mentality shift. And I'm grateful that I learned that through Nadine Griffiths, I think it was, who was the coach of the student side. And she was going, she said to a few of us, you know, you've got the potential to go all the way, but don't expect it to be handed to you on a plate. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. right, okay, we got to get to work, girls. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. your, so your first cap then during those autumns, how did it feel to, well, have the call up to receive the first cap? Um, how special was that for you? I think it went by in a bit of a blur, to be honest. Yeah. It happened so fast. I think I was more, um, and maybe because I had a bit more time to kind of adjust to what was happening. I think I was more surprised at the call up to the, the Welsh students game. Okay. Um, and really kind of like, oh my gosh, because that's probably because it's your first experience, right? It's all like, wow. And then you've gone through a few training sessions, you, you've played it, you know, that that international fixture in quotations against Scotland students, um, which is on my home field, by the way, in Bather, where I'd grown up and passed the rugby ball around from like the age I could walk. How bizarre is that? That was like that's, a- That's crazy, yeah. Yeah, that was like a full kind of um, come around moment. So I don't know, that felt bigger in some sense than getting my first cap. Wow. Um, yeah. At the time, like looking back, obviously not, but you know, things are moving so fast. You don't really get the time to digest it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose that's the first moment that you had recognition for your abilities in, in, a, in a sort of international sense, isn't it really? Mm. That you've had, you've had that. I'm yeah, I am one of the best in my age group or in my certain thing for, to be able to play international in Wales and that's that must be an amazing opportunity I know especially playing at home we spoke to Lisa Newton a couple of weeks ago and she said mm. that, that opportunity to run out on uh, on the brewery field was so special for her did you have the same feeling running out at Bethai? Yeah absolutely um, that was like a massive moment and I, I was always gutted that Bay they didn't have they had a, a youth a girl section but they never had the senior section and I really wanted to make that happen when I came back from uni um, a big part of the story I missed was when I when I started playing in university when I came home I was playing for Ponaclean so I've always been a one club girl in terms yeah. of Welsh rugby always played for Ponaclean nobody else um, and it started with me coming back and forth from from uni for four years um, but when I did come back from uni in um, gosh I can't even remember when that was 2005 six <laughs> um, yeah. I was really kind of like I want to set up a be the women's team. And, and you know, my ambition was to have like, you know, anybody in the area that wanted to play and have these girls feed through into a senior team. And I was really kind of stubborn about it. I was a lot younger. Um, yeah. Well, I'm still stubborn now, let's be honest. But um, <laughs> I was like, let's let's make that happen. My heart was still with Connor Clean. I thought I'll, I'll play for both and I'll help one develop yeah. and still play um, competitive rugby with Connor Clean. And myself and Catherine Grundy was also be the girl who played for Connor Clean was like, let's make this happen. We started putting up flyers and, and all of that stuff. And Richard Hodges from the WWRU back then, like got on the phone and was very much like, you do not, yeah. do not. And under any circumstances start up another women's team in that area. And so I sulked for a little bit. And on reflection, it was absolutely the right thing for him to do. The player pool doesn't exist and we would have been diluting other teams around us to start up our own team and it would have been completely wrong thing to do yeah. um so i can understand like i know if you've listened to it we've discussed it on our pod you know other teams are starting up but there's nobody yeah. controlling this now in welsh rugby it's like they're celebrating everybody starting up a team here then everywhere but you know we still don't have that player pool to you know to support all these teams we need somebody like that Richard Hodges to be strong and firm and you know pee people off rightly so yeah and say actually our strength is by putting out really strong high level teams with big squads rather than diluting the game sorry I've gone off your question or gone off on one there haven't I no no, it's fine (laughs) because I think you've you know, you were speaking there. I think it's one of the Cardiff sides. Is it? Is it? Is it the? Is it the the the, the Welsh team? Is that just formed? Is that what you're on about? No. So they've been going a little while. Yeah. 
they've been going in a while, and there's now going to be a fifth Cardiff team starting up. Yeah. Uh, Cardiff Quinns are coming back with a senior That's what team. It was. Yeah. yeah. And Cardiff Quinns got a huge, huge legacy. And, you know, I remember when they had their senior team, they had a bunch of internationals in there. It was a great senior team. But in, they were pretty much the only one in Cardiff at that time. Mm. And that's the, that team was strong. But now we've got another four and they want to bring in a fifth. It's just, I'd love them too. They deserve it because of all the work they do with the age grade. Yeah. But um, yeah, we just need somebody who's firm enough in Welsh rugby or somebody in Welsh rugby that understands that would be a bad decision. Yeah. 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 Go on, I think I think you've sort of alluded to this a few times, but I know there's a question on pathways coming, I think. <laughs> yeah, so um, well, you and uh, Lori Harris, your co-host on Back of the Girls podcast, um, you talk a lot about um, the pathway to international stage for the current crop of players. Um, how important was this development to your career? Mm, huge. Both, uh, both um, Lori and I were products of that. And we've seen it firsthand. Um, I come through a different way to Lowry, which is great, right? Because that's what you want. You want to be able to capture yeah. the best players wherever they might be. And that's something that's been decimated. And I don't use that word lightly, even though I use it a lot. Welsh rugby was decimated the last decade. And it's not by accident. It's, it's by choice. The WRU, you know, made decisions that led to, you know, they dropped the under um, 20s. They dropped the development. They dropped... Um, Wales A, they dropped the academy programs we had set up. Um, you know, you can't then expect somebody from like, you've been down to see our our premiership teams play. Um, mm-hmm. as, as great as it is to see them playing, you know, the level is nowhere near the English Premiership. No. Uh, we wish it was, but yeah. you know, the WRU have had well over a decade to decide if they're going to invest in that structure or not, and they haven't. All they've done is um, just like drop uh, reduce resources um, drop every pretty much every pathway that we've got other than that one uh, premiership season mm. you know and we've only we've, at some point we've had five teams playing in the premiership right how can that feed into a senior squad so Laurie and I are massive advocates she come through the under 20s um, I come through the, the development and, you know, we were in a very competitive Welsh environment and Welsh squad um, that had a bit more strength in depth than maybe the current squad has, or definitely the, the squad of the last four or five years. Um, and Pathways provides that. You know, you can't, like, we've got a massive opportunity now with these under-18s girls who were, let's be honest, strong-armed into putting in a team, right? Because it was a Six Nations decided to do it, not the WRU. So the WRU have gone, oh, crikey, we need to put in an under-18s team yeah. on the back of two weekends of regional, quickly grab some regionals together. We're going to take this squad up into the under-18s tournament, Six Nations tournament, and you've seen how well they've done. Yeah. Just based on pure talent. These haven't yeah. been nurtured. They haven't been developed. They've been scratched together. And the talent in Wales is unreal. Yeah. So... They've been promised, you know, regular camps. Uh, there was talk of them having a sevens. There was talk of them then being feed, fed into the under 20s. Nothing's happened since. There's no strategy. There's no plan on paper. Mm-hmm. You've heard me rant about this so many times. <laughs> but unless we take what I'm really, really scared of and what I know is going to happen because I've spoken to some of these people, a handful of these really talented girls are on their way to English um colleges yeah. and yeah. those colleges will mop them up we've seen it done before with some of the girls that are now playing for england who are welsh yeah um we're going to lose them yeah and um, i you know i don't mean to you know i've been on this rant about capping them it's not about like capturing them but it's giving them something they can believe in giving them a reason to stay committed to wales because we're investing in these girls and by providing pathways and a strategy and something not just the players but the whole of rest of this rugby fam that's forming can get behind whilst rugby can really thrive yeah. and you know it's not the wru versus us or us versus the wru we're all on the same team yeah. But my God, do they need to listen and put it, some pathways in place? Yeah, it, well it, 
it's 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 difficult, isn't it? Because I I watched Wales under 18s against Ireland under 18s. I saw mm. the likes of uh, Molly Reardon and Maya Dixon, who I also saw last weekend playing for Pontyclean, and they were superb. Yeah, we were, we, we, we were part of the Maya Dixon fan club already. I think Lucy and I. Yeah, we are. Um, yeah, she's brilliant. Then, from a personal standpoint, I was in school. I was a year older than Megan Jones. You know the the wasps. Yes. And, yeah. And she went on to play for for England in a World Cup final. And if you're losing those sort of quality players to England, how difficult is that to to sustain going forward? Um, yeah, yeah. It's... But it has English heritage, you know. She could easily yeah. get picked up by England. And let's be honest, if England has a very clear pathway for her, um, with with huge opportunity, as opposed to the scratch kind of grabbing things together we've got going on in Wales, you know, you can't blame her for choosing no. England. No. 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 But as as sorry, Carwin, I'm off on one. Um, no, <laughs> from a strategic point of view, right? I run two startups, right? Um, and I'm constantly having to think strategic. It's like ingrained in me. So when I look at the, what the WRU were doing, strategically, like Maya Dixon is one of our best future assets. Mm. You've got to throw everything at keeping her in engaged in the country or providing a league that's yeah. going to keep Maya Dixon's and the players like her invested in our game. Right. It's, mm. it's for us. Right. She's she's the future of Welsh rugby, her and her teammates. Mm. They're going to get us to World Cup finals. They're the ones that's going to get us to Grand Slams. Those Grand Slams are going to bring a massive amount of interest, massive amount of exposure, promotion for the game. You, we can't achieve that without investing in these players. Yeah. So, you know, from a business, Carwin, you have to wait. Sorry. <laughs> from a business perspective, <laughs> We've got ex-coaches and people that have done rugby development making executive decisions for something they obviously have no experience in. So, you know, I got obviously the business side and the rugby side just collide on this matter. And I'm just ferocious. But I'll let you talk now because you're the host. No, no. I (laughs) Only one small thing is that I suppose the logic from the WIU or logic, if you want to call it that, and is that by throwing these professional contracts, there's this hope to become a professional athlete now. But if there's no pathway to reach that point, there's that there's that still that's that gap between where they are currently, which is clearly non-professional athletes, and you know, Maya's a huge talent, but it hasn't reached that level yet, and a mm. professional athlete. And that's what you're talking about is the pathways, and that's what creates that stream through. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the English Prem in the moment. So that's locked in, in under contract for 2023. So it was decided a couple of years back that we we're going to send all our talent over to England so that they could play at a high enough level, right? It was a quick fix, stick a plaster on a broken leg, right? That's, that's what we're going to do for now. But that decision was made two, three years ago. Nothing mm-hmm. has been decided how we're going to bring Welsh rugby up to the same standard, whether that's through regional rugby or, you know, an ERC competition, whatever it needs to be, we need to explore it all. Um, I'm hopeful, really hopeful that Nigel Walker has got a a whole bunch of uh, potential um, avenues he can take the women's game sat on his desk right now and he's he's looking over them and trying to figure out the best one um, because it cannot continue, not even for another season without a strategy. And this is going to be my biggest bugbear this summer. If nothing comes up ready for September, then we're marching on the WRU, I think, guys, um, <laughs> because it's, you know, it's, they're our best assets and we've got to invest in them, like I said. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question about Nigel Walker going for- forward is that, you know, for, you've asked for him to come on the podcast several times. Has there been any movement on that? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Yeah. <laughs> And what would what would you like to see implemented sort of pre World Cup and post World Cup? Is there is there sort of one thing? I know it's not one one thing saves all, but is there one thing you'd love to see implemented pre World Cup and one thing post World Cup if you could have it? Um, I think the contracts were obviously a huge huge deal, but that doesn't solve everything that comes underneath it. And my issue is with the competitiveness of the English Premiership and the academies they've got and the colleges they've got, there's going to be fewer and fewer opportunities for Welsh girls to cross the border and start in these English clubs. They're eventually going to be phased out, right? As players start to retire, those shirts are going to be filled by English players. There's going to be fewer and fewer opportunity for us. So we need something over here, this side of the bridge in Wales, that our Welsh players can play in. So as girls start to retire in England, maybe they can 
you know, come back to what I know loads of them said they'd love to come back and play one last season in Wales um, and be kind of like, you know, the the leaders that can bring the next generation through and whether it's premiership or whether it's, you know, a regional game, I'm not sure what it's going to be. I would like Nigel Walker to, to come up with a solution. Um, and contracts for the senior women is a great fix, but it doesn't solve anything below it. And the problems is all currently below it. Like, I, I don't, you know, lean too much into the senior squad. It is it is what it is. The girls have got contracts. There's little strength in depth, but they're doing really, really well with what they've got. Yeah. Brilliant. But while that's going well, let's fix everything below it, right? Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, you've mentioned great leaders there, and we're going to segue back to your your international career yourself. And, <laughs> and you... You inherited your jersey somewhat from Lisa Burgess, didn't you? A, a, a true legend of the Wales game. Um, do you remember, did she have any words of wisdom for you at all? Do you remember any of that? Uh, <laughs> it's a funny one. She's such a character. I was lucky enough um, when I was coming into the senior squad, my first Six Nations to room with Birdie in every international. I was kind of like, I was filling Birdie's shirt. And yeah. she, fair play to her, she gave me so much time. She nurtured me coming through. Um, <laughs> but the birdie you see as a coach and the birdie you saw as a teammate are two very different people. <laughs> she, she was hilarious. Um, like, there's so much calm in the team. Um, birdie was definitely one of them when I was coming through. And she, she taught me how, actually, her and Trico Jenny Davis taught me how to use shampoo bottles that we pick up in hotels to practice our lineups. And that's no probably way. one of the most important things I learned from Birdie. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd line up, so all the forwards would meet in somebody's hotel room and we'd put the kettle on because we always had a tea club going and somebody bring out their caddy and, you know, all this like kind of travel um, tea sets. Um, <laughs> And then Birdie would pull out um, the shampoo bottles that she'd collected from hotels all around the world. Um, and we'd line them all up. And he was like, okay, so Gemma, you were this one. You were the, you were the conditioner, right? <laughs> and I this cause shampoo bottle. And then this cause, somebody calls this. And then we, we jump here or we move backwards. And all three bottles move backwards. So, yeah, I, I learned so much off Birdie. And I got so much respect for Birdie as a player. Um, I think we're possibly going to clash when it comes to... The development of the game because as much as I love Birdie um, she's been part of the setup all the way through this decimation of the game and you know I, I'd say this to her face because I respect her so much it's you know if you're going to be on the inside then you, you, you've got to do more you, you know it's you, you've been there this whole time um, what you know other than now when you're stepping out of a position of power to go and coach you know, what's been done on the inside, it's, it's not easy to see if you've had a role on the board. There's fewer women on the board now than when Birdie was put onto the board. It's, it just still mm -hmm. doesn't seem like we've had that movement forward. And somebody as passionate and as powerful as Bird, um, you know, I would like, do more. Everybody yeah. do more, you know? So yeah. um, we're hoping to get Bird on the podcast and I'll ask her these questions, you know, to her face. You yeah. know, I respect so much. But um, yeah. I didn't even know if that answered your question, Karen. No, it did. It did. Uh, the, the, the shampoo bottles wasn't yeah. the answer I was expecting, but yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah, go on. Um, over the next four years, then, he became a mainstay of the Welsh side, um, of the Welsh setup with massive highs, um, such as the Triple Crown in 2009 and then the World Cup in 2010. Um, do you have a particular highlight or was it maybe that win against England in 09 or was it anything else? Everyone ref refers back to that win in 09 against England. Um, it's, it's always memorable, because, not because of the, the end of the game and the score, but because of the feeling before the game in the hotel in the morning. We were so confident. I don't, it was like this eerie calm over the team and we were, we were ready. I don't think there was any question for the first time. And like, you know, sat down next to Louise Rickard, who had the, the most international uh, women's caps. Um, you know, I had breakfast sat with, with Non and all these like legends of the game. And like, they were all so calm. And then some of the newer caps were so calm. And that's, 
that's really quite strange, eerie almost. So when I think back at that game, two things strike me. It's that the morning of the game and then obviously the final whistle and that, like we dogged it out for that win. But, but more than anything, it's that when you know you're going to win and you just know, yeah. it's, it's so different. The only time I can relate to it happening another time was when the regional competition was was at the strongest in 2013 and we beat the Ospreys so the Cardiff Blues I was captain in the Blues team and we beat Shuan's Ospreys in Landarsi and you know the Scarlet and the Ospreys had pretty much all the superstars uh, but our Blues team just had this like utter belief yeah and I always put that that game down as my proudest rugby moment was this this team of you know no superstars but everybody would put their line their body on the line um, and there was this calmness around that team as well. So yeah. to emulate that calmness, I think, would be a gift in any kind of situation. Yeah. That just that belief. That's amazing. Um, you know, I, we, we thought it would be 2009, but yeah, <laughs> amazing to, to hear that it's that, that game that sticks in your memory. Um, from the World Cup then in 2010, you went on, you had a, you know, it was a brilliant campaign in, in some aspects. You, know, you had the group of death. It was, and I, we spoke to Lisa as well a couple of weeks ago, and she said how difficult it was against New Zealand. Did you find that yourself starting in the second row, that it was a daunting prospect for you? Yeah, going into this group of death, let me take you back a little bit. So in 2007, eight, nine, we had a string of results that the team hadn't had before. So we yeah. finished that like, top two. Um, so something happened in 2010 Six Nations before the World Cup where we finished I think it was either fifth or sixth maybe we had the wooden spoon and now we've gone from this like three year of high into absolutely crashing last in the Six Nations and that's the season that we're going into the World Cup yeah. it was more or less the same squad um, but for some reason we just took our foot off the gas so I think we were already on the back foot going into that Six Na- into that World Cup we lost a couple of players on the back of that Six Nations loss. Um, they didn't get played and they, they felt like they had, in that case, if they weren't going to get played, then they'd given enough to the shirt and they weren't going to commit to a World Cup as well. So it really felt like it was backs against the wall heading into that World Cup. Um, and then to obviously, you know, we were fully aware we were in the group of death as well. But yes, I remember going out, Australia was the first game. I will get you to answer your question now, Cameron. <laughs> Australia was the first game. And I just remember being incredibly tense for the first time in a Welsh shirt, probably the most tense I've ever been in a Welsh shirt. Um, so that's not good, right? If you think about like the calmness I spoke of earlier, as opposed to this like incredibly tense, like I don't remember there being music. I don't remember there being any kind of cheering or anything as we walked out. It's only when we watched it back later. I was like, oh gosh, look at all that noise. Didn't hear it at all. So we were incredibly focused, um, but, you know, tense because we knew like we're not as good as we were, you know, in the last few years so that felt odd and then um we lost against australia but then when we come up against new zealand you know i'm not saying we didn't go out and give it our all but we just well it's new zealand right they just yeah. they just don't give you anything so it was it was an odd world cup but we, we refer to it as a, a roller coaster so you know that ronan keating song Whenever we refer to the World Cup, it's like, life is a roller coaster. <laughs> that was kind of like our anthem in the kitchen um, when we were trying to unwind after the game. Uh, yeah, it was just tense, I think. Um, yeah. I think I think on reflection, we probably overtrained as well. I, I think the coaches would, would admit to that. We overtra- Trying to make up for our shortcomings in the Six Nations, we tried to train ourselves better, but you yeah. can't because it's such a short turnaround and really intense games. And we're looking at the likes of um, uh, New Zealand within the same block of us. They were just chilling on the grass all day. And we'd just been out and done a morning and an afternoon session. We were knackered. Mm -hmm. And you look at New Zealand and they're just like chilling on the grass, playing Frisbee. So it was like, okay, you can, looking back, you could see probably we didn't help ourselves, but you know, you can't take it away from New Zealand, right? Incredible. Yeah, I think I think that day you had uh, Sean Harris, a young Sean Harris, in your as your second row partner. I was going to ask if you pass anything on to Sean Ed as as bits of advice. Was it perhaps the shampoo bottles that you just mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think Sean Ed would take it if I tried to. <laughs> <laughs> a young chopsy Sean Ed Harris would have t- would probably tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Go, go on, Luce. 
Right. So, okay, moving on from the World Cup, um, you then, did you decide to retire from international? From the yeah, team, that, then, yeah. That was, yeah, that World Cup was my last. And yeah. strangely, I was a bit gutted because, no, I was happy with the decision because we got to live our life as well, right? So I was, a, yeah. you know, a full-time teacher and taking a break for this World Cup. And then I was continuing that break to go just travel and explore. Um, and I was actually ill in the World Cup. Um, I was had, it's really strange, we're not sure what I had. I had some kind of viral um, infection or, you know, some kind of virus or something. And the doctor prescribed me um, antibiotics, these big pink things. And it turns out I'm allergic to them. So when I finally <laughs> come off them, I run out of them. I ran out of them for two days and started to feel really good. And then she gave me some more. And then I started to feel bad again. And we were like, oh, okay, maybe stop taking these. And I was able to finish that South Africa game, my very last game. It was going to be my very last game in a Welsh shirt. Um, probably at my strongest point through that whole tournament. So um, I get it how the tournament went, but pleased that I got to play every game and I got to finish yeah. on beating South Africa. Mm. Um, and that was a pretty good place to, to tie, you know, hang up my boots because I had travelling to do, you know, very yeah. keen to see the world and explore. Yeah. And then did you play out in New Zealand, yeah? And planned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was traveling with um, Katrina, who played six in the World Cup. So we got down to New Zealand. Uh, eventually, I had to stop in off from various points on the way. And um, uh, Katrina was recovering from an ACL, so she went home early from the World Cup. So she started running and doing straight line stuff. She's like, "Oh, I think I might join our local rugby team and, and try out my knee and see how it's going." And I was like, "Oh, go on then, and I will." So we got our big <laughs> sent down. Because obviously you've got to play in your own boots, right? There's no way you can play in brand new boots. In no, that's not good for your feet. So we've got our boots sent down, and then we did pre-season with this club Stoke in New Zealand. Um, one of Cat's friends uh, has been playing down there for years. Former Welsh international as well, Nicola John. Um, so we started pre-season with them and loved it. Um, I honestly thought I was done with rugby in 2010, but you know. After that nice long break and kind of releasing all the pressure of everything yeah. um, and just taking time off to travel, got down there, got to play. And they were like, oh, do you want to play in the first game? And I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I'll go on then type of thing. So I played number eight. I was back to eight and um, just absolutely loved it. The style of rugby in New Zealand is incredible. And, you know, yeah. it's very much like being back in that club rugby scene where there's no pressure on you. You know, you the nobody from... Wales that is just kind of you know happened to pull on her boots and play it was pressure free exciting rugby and we ended up um, winning the the league oh fuck I didn't know yeah. that. No. that was you talking about the style that I was gonna ask was there a big contrast between um the game in Wales and the game in New Zealand massive in yeah. the sense of it's this, the kind of rugby that doesn't require a, a number on your back so it's all about open play. Anybody can pass the ball. Um, anybody can run. Anybody can be in space. Doesn't matter what, what number's on your back. We're in, in our rugby, it's very prescriptive. You're going to come around the corner. This pod is going to hit there. Um, it's, you know, and then if you lose possession, it's very reactive. Um, whereas in New Zealand, it's just really proactive in, in the way they play. It's like we... We're going to play off the shoulder. We'll have runners inside and outside, just try and break the tackle, keep the ball alive. The objective is keep the ball alive, right? Let's avoid a ruck at all costs type thing. And we want to be playing down in this part of the field, so get us down there. Yeah. Right? And then, it's you know, if there's a turnover, it's like, okay, we're like wall of defence now. Let's force the turnover. And it's just, oh, it's just the, the kind of rugby I love to play. You know, running yeah. off at 12 and 13. And I, I thrived in that environment. I really, really loved it. Do you think Do you think that's what it was, that when, when you came back in 2013, played in Pontyclean, do you think it was that love of the game that perhaps you'd lost a little bit with your illness in 2010, that you found you've got that love of the game that led to you have arguably best season winning Premiership player of the season at Pontyclean? Yeah, it, you know, it came as a surprise to me as well. <laughs> I came back from <laughs> travelling. And I turned up upon a clean for training again. And it was a case of, you know, because I knew I didn't have like, um, you know, autumn internet, well, not that we had autumn international then, but the autumn camp, I didn't have a yeah. Six Nations to prepare for. None of that, all that's been lifted. 
um, as much as I loved it, you know, from what, 2004 until what point was this, 2012, it was, you know, didn't have to think about it again, which was really freeing. Um, so just got to play and I brought that style that I'd learned in New Zealand up. I brought that confidence with it and got to play number eight again for club. So it was just, you know, when your confidence is high, you play really well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I you know, won a couple of awards and then got asked to come back into um, Blues and got asked to come back into the Welsh squad on the back of that. Yeah. It, it, you know, you had a had a season where I think you were vice captain in 2013. Is that correct for the Six Nations? That's then, right. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Glass Ankles Taylor was out being good <laughs> for most of the season. Uh, so I had to step up. Yeah. <laughs> And and then the following season, you found yourself out of out of the situation. How how difficult was that for you to take personally? Personally, really hard because um, you start to plan and you start to have expectations, right? You got brought into the the 2013 Six Nations, and you're like, oh, okay, this is the year before the 2014 World Cup. You know, do I want to be in that World Cup? And I'm like, yes, I do. So you start to ramp it back up again and you start to take things really seriously and you commit to what you know is going to be the next two years. Um, and, you know, it's what I wanted. I, I wanted to, at the time I was captain in Blues, I was captain in Wales. I was like, right, I want to be on Rachel Taylor's shoulder going into that next World Cup. But it mm. wasn't to be. wasn't to be. Um, it, we, we spoke a little bit about this beforehand. Did you find that transition then from... Being a being a rugby player effectively to, to to no longer playing international rugby and no longer playing rugby at all then eventually when you retired being a difficult one and for for the current crop of players that obviously there's these professional contracts now and we keep on hearing from the likes of David James etc how in, how difficult it was for him to to come out of professional rugby how difficult do you think it's going to be for them and is the support structure in place should the worst happen and their careers end? Yeah, so. We'll, we'll go to, Sorry, to yeah, how this. I did it. Um, it. It's not easy at all to um, be dropped. Um, maybe it's easier to, to hang up your boots and say, that's it, that's me done. Um, it's not easy to be dropped, um, especially when you're really committed and you, you wanted that World Cup. Um, but, you know, there's so many people that have had the, had the transition harder than me. I think I'm really lucky in the sense of... Um, when I finished playing rugby, I also finished teaching to start my own business. So it wasn't just I've lost rugby. Everything changed in my life in one kind of swoop of the summer. Um, so I had something I was really passionate about to channel all that energy in. So I left teaching to start my own business. I was incredibly passionate about what that business could do. Um, so I got to channel that energy, all the kind of skills and the, the discipline and the um you know the resilience I learned from rugby was able to channel into something else um and I know that not a lot of people get to do that and I'm incredibly you know grateful that I had that transition period it was a bit odd um, I tried a bit of coaching as well and it turns out I'm not a good coach so I tried <laughs> um so bear in mind I played upon a clean from 2001 up to 2015 and then 16 I tried to coach um and I'm a one club girl, like I said, there's only one team I was going to coach. But then you realise that, you know, you're trying to coach your mates and yeah. you're trying to coach people that you've, you've messed around with and, you know, being a fool in front of. It's kind of, it's incredibly hard. And I'm glad you've spoken to Lisa because she's managed it so well. There's so much respect for Lisa and her coaching, but it's just not something I could do. Yeah. Um, so I always thought I'd go into coaching, but that was a big wake up call. But luckily, like I said, I had uh, the business and the new kind of career trajectory to lean into. But there are others that have that have struggled. And you, you asked about the current crop of players. Um, we're all excited at the fact they got contracts. But what really worries me is there's, you know, this, who's looking out for them, right? Because the WRU is now their employer, mm. right? And the employer have just put a contract in front of them and they've gone to sign it. Who? who's the advice who's the guidance who's the the um the players association kind of thing to wrap around that so we've just seen in the english premiership the women's rugby player association has started up to protect these players these girls right think you know if the contract is crap to push back against it um you know 
image rights and things like that and you know holiday pay injury pay you know cover things like that you know who's been doing that for the welsh women because the union won't do it because it's working against the union right mm. so i really worry and this is not something i spoke about too often because the wrpa the welsh rugby players association is supposed to as part of its uh, memorandum or whatever it's called is supposed to support the girls as well but that's been in dire straits for a couple of years and it doesn't even have a ceo at the moment so there's nobody running that so I'm, I'm really concerned and i've spoken to a bunch of girls about it, like how do we protect these next generation of players who are going to become full-time athletes this has never happened before and even though it's great the infrastructure around them isn't in place yet and mm. that worries me so if one of them gets injured god forbid one of them, their career's over um, who's going to be the one that kind of mops that up and offers support and, you know, I don't say careers advice because you normally go back to like the school's kind of careers advice, not that, but that, that kind of lifestyle adjustment advice because you, you've just been sacked basically. Mm, so it yeah. worries me that the rest of the infrastructure isn't in place. They've gone and handed these contracts. Um, but what happens if somebody loses a contract now? Yeah, I think... I think that is a bit of a worry and I don't really I, I personally don't really understand but I don't know if anyone understands what's going to happen come the end of those contracts is it is it some sort of um process of reviewing the contracts and how how successful they've been and whether they continue with individual players or do you know anything surrounding that uh, we don't know much no um we know that a couple of players have, have said they only want a 12-month contract because they are leaving after the World Cup and they're going back to whatever careers they might have had which is great you know, or for them. But then we've got these young ones who are in uni or just out of uni um, or that kind of age who would be going into maybe entry-level roles if they were going into the real world of work, I'll use for, you know, want of a better word. But they're going into this professional athlete world. Um, but, you know, you can't... It's like taking 12-month contracts works, right? Like, nobody can... You, you can't be your best athlete if you worry about where your next paycheck's coming from, yeah. right? So if we're getting towards, let's say they have a new contract now in January, go through the rest of the year, come the Autumn Internationals, they're wondering, right, am I going to work for a job now in three months? You don't want them worrying about that. So we, you've got to think World Cup cycles for me. You've got to think, right, who are we locking in for the next four years? Who are we locking in for the next eight years? Who are we locking in for the next 12 years? And that goes for coaches as well, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it, yeah. We, we're fortunate enough we're going to be hopefully interviewing Georgia Evans, who had a really serious injury a couple of weeks mm. ago. Um, so it'd be interesting to pose some of those questions to her, really. What what sort of support yeah. has she, she, she found? Um, yeah, Georgia gets around, doesn't she? She's on everyone's podcast. <laughs> 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 no, out, out of interest, obviously, you've had Shona Tari on your pod. Um, she doesn't have a professional contract. If you would have actually been offered one, would you have taken one? Would I? Yeah. Um, depends. <laughs> Um, when I come back from traveling, yes, I would have taken one. Um, absolutely. That 2013 when I'm vice captain, I'm playing for the Blues. Absolutely. That would have been the ideal time for me to take a contract. Um, before that, I really wanted to travel. So I needed to get that out yeah. of my system. So, and that's the thing, right? People got other goals and other things they want to do with their life. But, you know, my goal was never to be a professional athlete. But what we're seeing now is young girls have that opportunity. So I'm sure there'll be, you know, for, for every one of me, there'll be like a hundred girls that would want a, a, a full-time contract straight away. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned, sorry, Karen, Lucy, you just mentioned uh, Sean Ed not having a full-time contract or any kind of contract. Come on, isn't it? Yeah. How can yeah, somebody yeah. get, yeah. you know, into the Six Nations team of the tournament, comes on for less than 40 minutes and gets, ma you know, player of the match, you know, wins yeah. the game for you, um, scores the only try against France. You know, it's, I know, yeah. I, I can't say too much because obviously I hear from Sean Ed sporadically, but I know there's there's been conversations and it just didn't go her way at one point. But I hope that the WRU just goes, do you know what, let's, we had a try with this 12 contracts. Let's get behind these girls for the next four years. I mean, there's no reason why Shauna can't play another two, three, four, six nations. Mm. Yeah, right? She... We've got to be thinking long term. 
Yeah. yeah. Another one of I, our personal favourites is Kelsey, and I think she's in a similar yeah. situation, isn't she? At the Cal- moment. Yeah. 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 Anyway. In, in yeah. a way, it needs to develop, doesn't it? You can't just stick with 12 full time contracts forever. No, it's and I think developed. we've got to be grateful. Lucy, you are right. It's, it, you know, we've got to be grateful for getting those 12. Yeah. You know, if you look at Ireland and Scotland, you know, mm. we are a, a little, we're not ahead of the curve. We're riding and grabbing home for dear life to the curve. Um, but, you know, it's, it was, why 12, right? It's just, yeah. it's a bit bizarre now. We tried 12, we've gone six nations with 12. All right, look at the impact that's made. Okay, let's ramp it up. The money's mm. there. We all know the money's there. Mm. They haven't got no staff in the women's game. So we know the money's there. <laughs> yeah it does seem you know I, I was re-listening to some of the earlier pods from last year and things like that as well before coming you on and uh hearing things you know hearing them talk about the fact that there wasn't a women's coach until the last minute you know that seemed seemed utterly bizarre when there's clearly the, the money there isn't it mm. yeah um I think we had a final question on Ponticlean, didn't we? We th- thought we'd ask a question about Ponticlean before we moved on. Luce, is, is that the case? Yeah, yeah. I know we've spoken about Ponticlean a few times now. Um, so you were obviously very much involved with the Falcons. Um, we actually bumped into two of the Hallett girls, the cousins, <laughs> um, a few weeks ago down, well, Ponticlean playing Nelson. Um, you had a really successful time towards the end of your career and winning several titles so yeah how how was that for you finishing your career um at the team you started at um the titles come after I retired actually which isn't very nice <laughs> I thought there were a couple but, uh, of caps as well hey eh? I thought there were a couple oh, of caps we won a couple well. of seals yeah, yeah. We won yeah. A couple yeah. Of seals. oh we loved that we celebrated that like we loved but like we won the world cup <laughs> what I always loved about the Falcons and the reason I never left the Falcons it was because we were it was just so much fun. Yeah. Um, and the culture of the team was awesome. I think, you know, if you look at Seven Sisters, it was very similar. Like, they've got an incredible culture um, and a kind of a belief and a love and a trust in each other. And we had very similar down upon a clean. They still have down upon a clean. Um, and we were just genuinely really, really good friends. And like you mentioned, you bumped into my cousins. I got to play with Levi and Demi as well. And there was a time when all three of us were on the pitch. Um, so, you know, it was just special. And I never, ever wanted to, to leave that. And I was lucky that, you know, Laura Prosso, I started my Welsh career with as well, played upon a clean. And even though we didn't have all the superstars, like I mentioned earlier, it was a team that, you know, utterly played for each other. And, um, yeah, it was... Wow, well, 2001 to 2016. So it was 15 years I spent at that club. So it's got a very, very special place in my heart. And you're still involved to this day? Uh, just watch it now. Yeah, Ten exactly. Minutes, turn up it yeah. And have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the crucial element, I'm sure. Yeah. Before we finish with the, the, the semi quick fire um, questions that we realised last time were not the most quick fire, but. Um, you mentioned on Back the Girls podcast, back all the way in episode two, that um, Lisa Newton's choice of song, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, was a particular affinity that was held with the uh, the Welsh girls pre the World Cup. What was your favourite pre-match song? Um, <laughs> I did like that one. That's still in my gym playlist now, but I'm a country girl, so I like to listen to country music, whether I'm in the gym, in the car, in the shower, or warming up for a match. So, yeah. I like my uh, foot stomping tunes. <laughs> is there is there one in particular, or just any any country? Uh, there's one that uh, made it right through to the 2017 World Cup. The, the girls are a big fan of um, the supporting girls. We all stayed in the same place, and that was uh, uh, "Chicken Fried" by nice. <laughs> Zach nice. Brown Band. <laughs> so that's made its way around Welsh rugby now. So again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the song that always comes up last in spin class i love that song <laughs> <laughs> um okay next question um we know you definitely looked up to scott quinnell um but who was your rugby inspiration scott quinnell mm. was it why yeah. and why um probably because he was eight and yeah. he just epitomizes it like strength power talent leadership um, you know everything a captain should be they did his talking with his rugby he also did a lot of talking as well didn't he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so it's just does. that 
yeah, you know, I was in very impressionable age and it just it just stamped something on my soul. And I've always grown up with this admiration for Scott Bernal. And it's really weird now. Quick fire, you said, right? I got a yeah. story for you. <laughs> Sorry, go so, <laughs> I was actually at an event and Lisa was there and we met Scott Bernal. She made me have a photo with him and I was like, oh, hi, hi. And then I like, blushed and, and walked away. And then like two weeks later, I won Premiership Player of the Season in the Principality. Scott gave me the trophy. And again, I went, oh, hi, Scott. <laughs> it was really weird. I'm not starstruck by anybody. I've like met them all, like, you know, played out of the, of the veil and all that. So, you know, chatted to all the Welsh superstars. And it's just that not bothered at all. Met a few famous people, not bothered at all. But you put me in a room with Scott Pinnell and I melt. <laughs> it, reminds, so. it reminds me of uh, us meeting John Fox Davis, Luce, and I didn't know whether to speak to him in Welsh or wow. English. So I just didn't mix it both. <laughs> Ten Millane, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even use the excuse. I was drunk. Uh, go on. Next, <laughs> um, what do you tell youngsters, young girls, who are maybe unsure about starting rugby at a young age? What would you tell them, um, or even a younger self? Um, a, a young self just needed the opportunity so I think what, what young girls got now is the opportunity and I tell them to go grab it um, you know, like somebody said to me when I first started one of the girls at uni said to me right you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it I said if you love it you, you like your life will change and mm-hmm. that's exactly what I think I'll pass on to somebody else because you know there's nothing like that camaraderie that that family feel if you get into the right rugby environment and I'd, I'd say to any girl um you know give it a try because it will send your life on a trajectory you never imagined mm-hmm. um and especially now with contracts even yeah. further right let's shoot for the moon now well done um you mentioned before that Maggie Alfonsi was probably your hardest opponent that you played you mentioned that on your, your on your podcast um, is there any others that jump to mind as a as a hardest opponent? I know you mentioned Sean Ed as well. <laughs> um, let's keep it to club rugby. Um, Lisa Newton at Cardiff Wins, now Landa. Um, God, she was a handful to play against. <laughs> um, Katrina Nicholas played with her, so they were like six and eight, mm-hmm. and they were a nightmare pair together, and especially when Sean had joined them then, that was the back row. Um, so yeah there's so many good club players or good regional players that have never got the attention they deserve um, and you know we've we've said on the pub on our pod you know you credit a player by how much you don't want to play against them so yeah. those were definitely up there brilliant okay um, the next question is what's your the um, best stadium most memorable your favourite stadium Um I know we've mentioned Bay Thai. <laughs> it could be that, but is there any, anywhere else that? Um... <laughs> I'm going to say uh, Carly Farms Park, just because that ground is so fast. And yeah. I, was, I was in 2013, like, you know, ageing a bit now. And I've never been so fast as the games we played on that. So, <laughs> I, you, know, you know, I've played in New Zealand, now South Africa, I played this season in Australia as well, but I'm going to say the Carly Farms Park. One is because it's home, right? And it's legacy and it's historic. But two, because the ground is so fast and I was like lightning on it. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, and then final question. Um, and hopefully we've had a small rendition of a yes, song. We have. Um, <laughs> but we were wondering what was your favourite sort of post-match song or karaoke song? And would you mind singing us out to finish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it has to be, doesn't it? It has to be. Um, and this is mainly because of the 2010 World Cup squad it's that uh, don't stop believing oh, wow. that's yeah. strong so when I think when you talk about songs uh, that us in the changing rooms whether we just got smashed by Australia or New Zealand or we just beat you know whoever it was one of the songs always came on and always lifted everybody in the room and then I've, I've probably also got to mention uh, the Tina Turner song because Lowry made that historic for the team. Yeah. So what is the one that rolling? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So probably those two songs are the most iconic from my time in the team. Do we get a rendition or, or, or are we not having one to end? I'll leave that when Lowry comes on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Gemma. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I've really enjoyed it. Well, both of us have really enjoyed yeah. it. I think. I really appreciate it, yeah. yeah.
And, oh, uh, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, I, I hope it's okay to say this. When you guys interviewed Lisa, you reached out to our pod and you said um, you didn't realise we existed until we liked one of your tweets, wasn't yeah. it? And you were like, oh, there is a women's pod out there. And you, you came on the DMs and you guys said, you know, hope you don't think we're encroaching in this space. And, you know, we were like, oh, bless. And we was like, of course we don't. Like, the more, the merrier. And like, you now amplifying former players, current players. You know, that's just really, really important to shine the light on our game. The more people we can reach, it's such a niche sport. Mm. And the WRU does, does a really great job covering over the cracks with their massive marketing team and their, their comms. Um, but it's not all perfect. And we want it to be perfect for the next generation, right? We want them to have better than we, yeah. than we ever had. And you guys and us and everybody else can get on that kind of, that army or in that train is, you know, is vital. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you guys and for the work that you're doing for women's rugby. So thank you. Oh, uh, no, thank you very much for those kind words. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a quick plug for your own part, because it is it is really worth a listen, yeah. as I mentioned at the start of the podcast. It's, it, it's, it's on, phenomenal. It's on. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. Uh, it's on all streaming platforms, all audio streaming platforms, is it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So if you want to know a bit more about the women's game, if you want to know a bit more of the history and the legacy of the game as well, tune into our podcast. It's called Back the Girls Podcast. It's available on all the platforms. It's not shiny. It's not, you know, super well produced and, you know, all the bells and whistles. It's literally us <laughs> keeping it real, having a beer, having yeah. a chat. And that's exactly how it should be. So if that's your cup of tea, join the Back the Girls podcast. And we've got a summer series coming up, actually, where we hope to speak to a lot of girls that have um, played their part in not just on the field, off the field as well. Yeah, sounds brilliant. I can't wait to listen. In that, yeah. um, so thank you very much again, Gemma. And yeah, so long, for, so long from me. Yeah, ciao. Thank you, guys.